guest, ladies and gentlemen, is also going to focus on Europe, of course. She says, a strong Europe is a competitive Europe, is a proud Europe. And we are going to welcome here on stage Helle Thorning-Schmidt. You might know her, she was a politician in Denmark, she was in the parliament in Denmark and also in Brussels. And she was prime minister between 2011 and 2015. And in that time, she guided the Danish economy and the Danish people through a severe economic crisis. After her political career, she led the international organization Save the Children as CEO. And today, she sits in several foreign policy think tanks and company boards in Denmark, in the UK, and in the USA. Since three years, she has another very, very interesting job. She is co-chair of Meta's Oversight Board. And I can imagine that we might come back in the Q&A about some points that Tobias Habel already mentioned. But now, let's welcome with a warm applause, Helle Thorning-Schmidt. <laughs> ah. Welcome. It's fantastic to, uh, to be here, and I was delighted that I actually got to hear the young folks uh, talking about what their Euro Europe looks like. That's, uh, that's amazing. Uh, hold on, I just had to um, look. <laughs> so, I'm so happy to be able to talk about Europe today, because if there's something that is close to my heart, it is Europe. And there are a thousand reasons for that, but I'll start with the first one. My father was born in uh, 1932, and one of the stories that he kept talking about was uh, when he was nine years old, uh, on the 9th of April, uh, 1940, when he, because he lived in the southern part of Jutland, could hear the German troops, artillery, and boots entering Denmark to occupy Denmark. It's not longer ago, I know I'm very old, but still, it's not very long ago that this happened in Europe. That we spend far too much time fighting with each other, far too had, uh, scary moments being scared of each other. It's not that long ago. So when I stand here today and say that we should be proud Europeans, uh, it is because of that. Because we have managed in Europe with the help of people that came before us in the 1950s, where they sat together and decided, no more. We don't want to be in that situation anymore. And what we're going to do is to give a little bit of our sovereignty to a common pot. And by doing that, we will create peace in Europe. But we're not only going to create peace, we're also going to create prosperity. And for me, that has always been the part, uh, been what I loved about Europe. It might be weird to talk about loving Europe, but I'm quite a constant person. And I do think that we owe Europe to talk about actually creating a project which is peaceful and has given us prosperity. I've been involved in European decision making for a long time, three decades actually. And I can tell you one thing, I've been in European Parliament, I've been in European Council, I can tell you one thing, that it's never pretty to take decisions in the European Union. It doesn't look great, not from the outside and certainly not from the inside either. But what we managed to do in Europe, time after time, we managed to take decisions on the big issues. And what are the big issues we have to deal with these days? Let's look at it. We just talk about digital security. We are talking about cyber security, security in general. We are talking about protecting our borders from uh, Ill illegal immigrants and asylum seekers where we have to get a, a system in place. We are talking about protecting Europe in terms of 
real security, what we see, the, all our invasion of Ukraine. We are talking about climate change and protecting our environment. We are talking about being competitive and having prosperity and eco economic opportunity for all. And I think I mentioned 10 things here. And the big question is, can any of these things be solved by any individual member state alone? I come from a small member state, but even the big ones cannot solve these big issues alone. And that is why it is such a clever idea to say, yes, we will join this organization and pool our so sovereignty and make sure we take decisions together. And the good thing about Europe is that once we have taken a decision, we actually move forward. In all the crises we have had in many, over many years, we have always found a solution. And that is the strong, strongest part about our European Union. Does that mean that everything is good? Certainly not. We still have so many issues that we need to solve. And I'm delighted that so many young folks are here today because you are going to be part of solving it. So in order to gain our competitiveness and gain our proudness of Europe, we need to be serious about solving all these issues and inventing new solutions. Because the special thing about Europe is that we don't have another region in the world that we want to be. We, don't, we can't look at the states and say, oh, we want to be just like them. I don't think any Europeans are doing that. And as we know, every day more and more people do not live in democracies. Non-democracies are spreading through the world. So we don't have another region to look to. So that is why every time there is an issue, we have to find out how are we, these 27 member states, trying to solve that and invent solutions all the time. But what are the solutions we need to find? Yeah, first of all, we need to get up in gear in terms of the, our economy. We need to find our competitiveness again. People are looking at Europe still and saying, things are too slow in Europe, we're looking elsewhere. So we need to work that out and create a common market that actually works and keeps developing. We also need to take our responsibility for climate change extremely serious because we are the ones that has to do it. So we need to change our energy mix and we need to create more sustainable energy for all of us. And we need to create the legislation, the permissions, the solutions to do just that. We also need to protect ourselves and have a secure Europe. That means changing the way we talk about this and also how we fund our own security. And I could go on, because in the next phase of our life together as Europeans, it's not like the problems are getting smaller, they're getting bigger and we have to find new solutions. But the biggest issue we have to solve in the coming years is where we want to place ourselves in the world. We can't just copy what everyone else is doing, as I said before. We are seeing a world that is becoming uh, bipolar, um, but perhaps even multipolar. And in that world, we can't do what we've done before, lean very closely toward the US. We have to find our own, uh, our own role in the world. So the next steps is that we try to work out how should Europe position itself in terms of the Middle East crisis? How should we position ourselves in terms of the uh, war in Ukraine? How should we position ourselves in climate change, as we talked about? And how should we position ourselves in terms of the, um, the crisis or the relationship that we have between China and the U.S.? And in all these areas, we have to find the new European way. And in order to do that, we need to agree and we have to find new solutions. My suggestion to European leaders this, uh, these years is to not copy what anyone has done before, but to find new solutions together. And also look at other countries and see what are they doing. What does that mean? It means that we can't sit back and say, oh, we are so good and we don't have to talk to people who are not like us. 
We have to talk to people who are not like us. We have to talk to people who are not living in dem democracies. We have to engage. That also means for China, for example, that where everyone is saying that we have to decouple. No, we have to say, no, we're not decoupling. We are de-risking our relationship to China. And where everyone is saying, you can't do it your way in terms of regulation, we have to say, yes, we're going to do it uh, our way. We're not copying anyone else. And I have been giving very short time to talk today. We'll get some questions. But the last thing I want to say is about this. In order for us Europeans to remain confident in this world and proud of what we are and what we have achieved, we must step out of the shadow of the US. I'm not talking about not having that alliance, but we must step out of the shadow and find our own way. That means creating more competitiveness in the European Union, but it also means that we brush off all the areas that we are most proud of. If I work uh, any of you up at four o'clock in the morning, I know what you would all say about what we are proud of. We are proud of the fact that we have created a social market economy in Europe. We still have welfare states. We are proud that we are abiding by rule of law, we are proud of our democratic model, and we are pri proud about our human rights. So moving forward, let's be more competitive. Let's be able to manage this whole new global uh, security order and the new order in general. But let's never forget what we came for, from. We came out of war and destruction, and what we are, when we are strongest is when we hold on to our values. That's what we should be proud of. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You said, let's be more competitive. How? <laughs> See, being competitive is a mixture of so many things. It's a mixture of spending the enough money on basic education, on research and development, on building out the single market all the time, of not over-regulating our economy, which we sometimes have a tendency to do in Europe, uh, and to build out the single market to more areas. And I think also what we have been successful with in the European Union is to become bigger. We have enlarged all the time. We are going to enlarge uh, again, and we shouldn't be too scared of enlarging. But that's one part of competitiveness. It's also about keep engaging with the rest of the world, not be scared of globalization. And that's why I'm, for example, talking about we need better relation to African countries. We need to engage with the Gulf states. Uh, we need to in, uh, engage with Asian countries. And we need, of course, to find our own path for China, which is not copying uh, the US, but where we find our own path for China. So competitiveness is a whole range of issues, and all of those things are part of that. We need to hurry up. Uh, if you mention, we need to hurry up. <laughs> we need to hurry up because if you mention Africa, for example, Russia and China are very present yes. there, huh? and and they want maybe not be happy to give some space to to Europe to jump no, in that, there as well. That is the case. Every time we leave a gap or a void, uh, some other people step in. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually I, I used to be a director CEO of Save the Children International. I've seen firsthand how meaningful it is, the development assistance that European nations uh, give, and how we are changing the world by doing that. So again, I want us to engage in African nations, not only as a savior and helper, but also as a business partner. And I'm so happy to see that European, the European Union is doing that. And let's not forget that it might be true that China is engaging, but the uh, European bloc is still a very powerful economic bloc. So I think people still want us to engage and engage with us and have trade with us. Mm. Let's use that tool. Mm. I like your optimistic view. Um, I can't help no, it. This no, is no, how I wake good. up every that morning. Was not ironic. Yeah. That was ironic. <laughs> I really like it. I uh, wanted to ask you, I mean, we are in Switzerland here, and this, yeah. this question has to be asked about the role in Swiss, uh, yeah. of Switzerland uh, on the continent, because we are a non-member of the EU, nothing new, right? And, uh, but we are in the center here. Yeah. That's the heart of the continent. So what do you think, what role should or, or has Switzerland to play in the whole, let's say, game? Yeah, first of all, I want to say that I, I love Switzerland. I come here quite a lot. It's a, it's, a, it's a place that I've been a lot. And it's like you come to Switzerland, you say, 
I can't tell them anything. I can't tell them how to run a country because they know perfectly how to run a country. So I would never attempt to do that. This is an amazing country in so many aspects. But what I want to say to Switzerland is that we will always need Switzerland in Europe and also engaging, it will always be in Europe, but we're also engaging actively in Europe. Because when I talk about being proud and talking about our democratic values and our human rights and our rule of law, we also need Switzerland to play a role in that. Switzerland has played an amazing role in hosting some of the UN uh, bodies and also because of the neutrality has played an amazing role. We're just seeing what the uh, International Red Cross is doing right now as we speak in trying to help with hostages. So this is also the legacy of Switzerland using its power to be part of that. So we were all always in the European Union think work more with Switzerland and your what we only thing we ask of you is let us in talk to us uh, and uh, try to influence us with human rights democracy and rule of law which is so strong here you're a perfect ambassador for ah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, think I can get a job yeah. I, I don't actually I don't know um, if if um, anybody here in the room I, I tried to change yes, let's change, let's, let's change. Yes, no, let's, that's a, it's an did, opportunity we, right we did the thing should we make a dance or something yeah. like that <laughs> um, uh, my question is, I don't know if anybody knows here in the room Meta's oversight board. Actually, it was not very familiar to me before I did some research just about you. Could you please very briefly explain what is the board for? Yeah, I'm delighted to be able to do that. Four years, five years ago, Meta realized that they couldn't do their own content moderation alone. It simply wasn't sustainable that basically Mark Zuckerberg could be woken up in the middle of the night and taking decision on what pieces of content could stay on the platforms and what had to be removed. It was an unsustainable solution. Meta does a lot of content moderation, but they also get a lot of th things wrong. So what they decided was to create an independent board uh, or council where we take final decisions on content on uh, Meta platforms, Instagram, and Facebook. And when it is, when we, we are independent because they, they don't pay my salary, they, they pay via So who pays trust. your salary? They pay via trust and it's a trust that has hired me. So they can't sack me. That's okay. the most important thing. Um, they can't get rid of me. Um, uh, so that's really important. It was important for all of us that I can't be dependent on Meta. I need to say and do what I want. And it's the same for my 21 colleagues. So basically, we take decisions on content moderation, and Meta follows our decisions. So we have the final word on content moderation. Uh, so you're above Zuckerberg, actually. Uh, in terms of content moderation, yes. Uh, not in all decisions, because obviously, we can only take the most contagious and difficult content moderation decisions. But when we have taken a decision, they have to follow us. And also, we give them a lot of recommendations. So who, who is the, the, the wish um, of, of uh, let's say, moderating a content, which means also banning somebody like Trump? Yeah. We come, we, I will come back to this later. Who is this coming up to you? Anyone. It can be anyone. It can be as just a citizen or anyone can actually, if they complain to Meta and they don't like the decision, they can bring the decision to us. Obviously, we can't take all decisions because we get millions uh, and we take some of them, but we take the most principled ones. Uh, I advise you, if any of you are lying awake in the night and don't know what to do, go on our website because it's amazing because what you are seeing is that content moderation is very difficult because what we are trying to balance is basically my free speech. There is a time where my free speech will impact on your human rights. Like you shouldn't feel threatened, there are certain things I shouldn't say about you, there are protected groups that we can't talk about in certain ways. So that balance between uh, one human rights, which is free speech, and other human rights, that is the balance we have to find. And that's what we're doing every day. And it's very difficult to do content moderation, particularly at scale. So that's what we're helping Meta to do. And I would say, Meta is certainly not perfect, but if you looked at, at X and other social media uh, platforms, I will still say that Meta has grown up enormously over the last five years, and are much more responsible in their content moderation than they were before, and much more responsible than, for example, X. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent do you work together with governments? Um, we don't want to work with governments um, in the way that uh, I think governments are really bad 
government should not be left content, a decision on content moderation. Why do I say that? Because everyone thinks government regulation is a great idea. But let's not forget that more than Every day, more people live in, not demo in, not in, in places that are not democracies. And there's more people living in places where they don't have democracy than people living in democracies. And that's only going to go up over the coming years. Every decent dictator in this world would love to get access to moderating people's content. And that's why we have to find a balance of trying to keep governments out of, of content moderation. It shouldn't be social media platforms either. We need to have regulation, which we're doing in the EU right now, the Digital Services Act. We need to have independent bodies like the one I'm co-chairing. Uh, and we need to, companies to be super responsible. So it's that triangle. I'm more interested in, in governments doing content moderation. They're actually really, really badly placed to do that, and they are dying to do it. Uh, they really would love to say, oh, this opposition group shouldn't be on the social media platform. Uh, this part of the conflict should not be represented. It happens every day that autocratic systems are trying to take uh, content down that they don't like. As we all know, we are permanently uh, uh, confronted with fake news, and we know yeah. all that w one single post can really have fatal consequences yes. when we think about yeah. the former president Donald Trump, yes. right? So um, you banned him. Um, was it the board or was it We didn't decision? ban him. Meta banned uh, Trump uh, when he started instigating violence. They then asked us afterwards what we thought about their decision and we actually agreed with them. Ah, okay, uh, but now yeah. he's back. He's so back. You, you, yeah. allowed, you allowed him to no, come back? We, no, we didn't allow him back. Uh, Meta did. What we actually said to Meta, which is a really good thing to say to Meta, that they, what they did to Trump is that they just removed him and said he, had, uh, he was off uh, the platform indefinitely. So we said to Meta, you can't do that. You can't just invent a new rule for a single user. You have to use your own sanction system, and you have to create a sanction system, system for this user as well. So that's what they did. So after three years, or two years, I'm not sure, he came back on the platform. Uh, and if you look at what post, uh, Trump is posting now, it is uh, not instigating violence. It's very sort of uh, small things that he's posting. But as soon as he posts something that will instigate violence, I'm sure Meta will react to that as well. And you observe him as well, I guess. We are observing everyone all the time, but it's Meta's job. <laughs> it's Meta's job to observe what goes on on their platform. I think it's super important that Meta takes this responsibility. Uh, it's their responsibility that what happens on their platform is okay. And that means it should be safe and it shouldn't instigate violence. So that's the most important thing. The other thing that will be platform's uh, responsibility in the future, coming back to your question as well, is uh, false uh, news. And uh, one of the things that will happen in the AI Act that's coming from the European Union, another good thing from the European Union, is that they will put, we don't know quite yet, but it looks like they will put the responsibility of the platforms to make sure that what they put on their platform is not moderated by artificial intelligence, made up. And I will say that the biggest threat to our democracy, now I've been talking about why we should be proud of our democracy, the biggest threat to our democracy moving forward is that we don't know what's true and we don't know what's false. Tri democracy is based on a foundation where we can trust what we see, where we have good journalism that can help us doing that. But if there's too much AI-generated content and we don't know what's true or false, then we have a huge problem for our democracy, particularly in a world where people don't trust anything anymore. They don't trust journalists. They don't trust politicians. People do not trust anything anymore. So that is why the next years will be so important in trying to find out how we make sure that AI doesn't go run amok uh, or go rogue and invent things uh, and put things on the platforms that are simply not true. But let's not forget that even before we had AI, it was perfectly po possible for politicians to say things that were not true. Um, the storm of the con uh, Congress was not made by social media. It was made by Fox News, uh, if you want to p place uh, guilt. So I do think we also have to find a level of criticizing social media where we remember how much amazing positive things that has come out of social media, but also that we need to be vigilant and uh, regulate where regulating is needed and make sure that, for example, we have uh, independent oversight. Thank you very much, Helle Thorning. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>